Hello, everyone. My name is Somini Sangupta. I'm the international climate correspondent for the New York Times. Welcome to the New York Times debate at South by Southwest. This is the first of many such events that we're convening in the run up to the big international climate talks taking place in Glasgow, Scotland in November. There, the New York Times Climate Hub will be convening 10 days of live journalism while showcasing the work of my colleagues to cover the global impact of climate change. So we know what the problem is. We know that we have warmed the Earth's atmosphere, mainly by um, burning oil and gas and coal. We know that 2020 was uh, tied as the hottest year on record, tied with 2016, bringing wildfires, heat waves, droughts all over the world. We know what the problem is. Now, do we have what it takes to solve the problem? That's really what today's debate is about. The motion before us is we currently have all the tools we need to stop climate change. By tools, we don't just mean hammer and nails. By tools, we also mean, do we have the political systems that are necessary? Do we have the economic systems that are necessary? Do we have the human imagination? Do we have the solidarity needed to really tackle this enormous global problem for all of us? So again, today's motion for the debate is we currently have all the tools we need to stop climate change. We have two teams of debaters, three each. They will be making their arguments three and a half minutes each to start with. We'll have three rounds of arguments. We will bring you then uh, our judges who will assess how they've done. The goal here is to have um, a really rigorous, rich, fun debate. The goal is not to declare the winner. Um, the winner really is all of us who hopefully will come away from this with a new set of insights, new knowledge. Um, about how we live now. So with that, I want to introduce to you our first round of debaters. A reminder, the motion before us is, we currently have all the tools we need to stop climate change. For the motion, Chris Stark. Chris is the chief executive of the United Kingdom's Committee on Climate Change. He and his team help the British government and the British people figure out how to meet this big challenge that they've set for themselves, which is to be net zero by 2050. Arguing against the motion, Dr. Sweta Chakraborty. She is a behavioral scientist. She'll be speaking um, from her expertise which is you know, peering into our, our collective minds. So three and a half minutes each, please take it away. For the motion, Chris Stark. Thank you. Judges and assembled members of our virtual audience, I am here to tell you today very firmly, but very politely, of course, that this can hardly be called a debate at all. Of course, we have the tools we need to stop climate change. We have a mountain of evidence and analysis to prove it. Our common goal is net zero, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to the lowest possible level and then removing from the atmosphere whatever is still being produced. We mustn't overcomplicate it. That is the point when we will halt our damage to the climate. And ladies and gentlemen, that moment is much closer than you may think. It's true that fossil fuels are the basis of the modern economy. It's true that we won't turn that around overnight, but things are now moving at pace in the opposite direction. The innovation has already paid off. The costs have already fallen. The smart money now is on low carbon. It's not on high carbon. So the most damaging myth is that we don't know enough today that we should wait. We absolutely must not. 
With what we know, right now, we can already plot a path to net zero and even beyond net zero. And we can do that with confidence. The electricity that we need to generate, the transportation services that we will need, the heating and the cooling for homes and buildings, the manufacturing processes, the construction materials, the zero carbon fuels, even the food we eat, everything can be decarbonized. All have clear paths to net zero now. There was a time when we had gaps in our understanding, but we don't any longer. And we can connect together all of those technical steps to cut greenhouse gas emissions. So there really is no excuse for inaction. What matters most is the decision to embark on the journey to net zero. From that point onwards, the benefits really begin to accrue. Here in the UK, offshore wind, once one of the most expensive ways to generate electricity, now it's the cheapest. That didn't happen by magic. It didn't happen because we waited. It happened because we had the confidence to commit to a known technology at small scale when it was expensive and at larger scale as industry delivered the amazing innovations that slashed its price. The truth is, existing technologies can take us to net zero, even with super cautious assumptions about technology development and cost reduction in the future. We have no need for new solutions, although I am sure they will come and I will welcome them when they do because they're gonna help us move even faster along this path. We can also do the more simple job now of cutting our consumption of high carbon goods and services and consumers will see savings for doing so. There is enough land to grow the food that we need and to lock up the carbon that needs to be locked up in the natural world. And if things don't go to plan, we have backup options, we have alternatives for every single net zero challenge in every area. And finally, to the cost. Cost is no longer the barrier that it once was for decarbonisation. Thanks especially to the plummeting cost of renewable power and the technologies that use it. We don't need fossil fuels for cheap energy anymore. And the cost advantage will grow the sooner we deploy low carbon solutions at scale. So ladies and gentlemen, why wait? What more do we need to commit to net zero? Net zero is absolutely essential. It is completely feasible and it's also cost effective. So it's time to act. Thank you very much, Chris, for coming in on time. Against the motion, Dr. Swetha Chakraborty. Thank you. And first, let me say how relieved I am that we are having a debate on the solutions to stopping climate change rather than whether or not climate change is an issue. So that shows progress. This is a good thing. But for us to say that we have all the tools across science, technology, innovation, and behavioral interventions in our toolkit, all of which we will need to contend with this massive collective crisis here already and that we collectively face as a global, global populace is at best irresponsible and at worst catastrophic. There is significant challenges ahead that we have to really contend with that range from 1.5 degrees warming, best case scenario, which is becoming increasingly clear was a low estimate of where our planet is headed and upwards of three to four degrees warming by the end of the century. So if we don't think forward and ahead to these worst case scenarios, we are not doing our, we are not committing to the social contract that we are all part of as global citizens. Climate change and its ripple effects does not recognize or appreciate political borders. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet, you will be impacted by climate change. And we know it's those most vulnerable that experience the most catastrophic impacts. So if we don't plan for these worst case scenarios, it's those vulnerable communities that will suffer the most. Are we willing to do that? Are we happy with the tools and solutions that we have right now? to ensure that everyone is protected or will some people just not be? And we're going to have to contend with how we've handled that morally today. And so we have to recognize that even with the tools we have, even if we are able to deploy them and or invest in research and development, we still have a massive challenge in terms of political will to overcome. The United States is just a microcosm of the rest of the world in trying to convince people to not just recognize the reality of climate change and its many ripple effects, but also to then make better decisions for themselves, their communities, and ultimately change behaviors. And we're going to need this in a widespread way for us to see really significant change. 
How do we do this? Do we have the tools to do this? We have come leaps and bounds in behavioral science, which includes advances in neuroscience, behavioral economics, cognitive behavioral psychology. That's fantastic. But there's a long way to go to increase public literacy. So the minimum understanding of what is coming is there. So then effective communication practices can also frame the issue in a way that is relevant for the end recipient so that people actually hear the science and integrate it into their daily decision making. That hasn't happened. And because of that, there isn't the political will to forge forward with these solutions that we have and that we need to still invest in. This is something that still requires cross collaboration across disciplines and really breaking down the silos across the hard scientists, the technologists, the investors, and the social scientists. Once we're able to do this, then we can really come up with tools that look at the big picture, that this isn't just one simple challenge. It is a collective, complex, interconnected, global emergency that transcends political borders. And it's going to require much more innovation and investment into research and development to even be able to take uh, to 10 seconds to get these worst case scenarios. Okay, thank you so much. Two words uh, that I took away or two notions that I took away already. Chris saying, we have enough. Sweta saying political will still uh, lacking and a common understanding still lacking. Our second round of debaters, the motion remains the same for the motion. Emma Howard Boyd, chair of the UK government's uh, environment agency against the motion Hindu Umara Ibrahim, uh, president of the indigenous women and peoples of Chad and an advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Emma, three and a half minutes for the motion. Thank you. I'll start by talking about one vast, complex and vital global industry. Construction is one of the biggest emitters of carbon worldwide, but many in that industry would say that their client's priority is to bring costs down, not take action on climate change. But no one who works in construction wants to build wind turbines that freeze in a Texas ice storm or build energy efficient homes that could wash away in a flood. They want to build things that last. Do you remember the Oscar ceremony when Frances McDormand won Best Actress for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri? She proposed actors should demand an inclusion rider. I propose everybody should demand a climate emergency rider. If you are commissioning any work from any industry, you should ask how that work is actively reducing carbon emissions, racing to zero, and how it is resilient to the coming shocks like storms and heat waves racing to resilience. If the answer is the technology hasn't been invented yet, that's just not good enough. A business that pins all their hopes on the R&D department is a risky investment. Greta Thunberg has talked about cathedral thinking, which means we must lay the first stone without knowing exactly how to construct the ceiling. But we are not working blind. As David Attenborough explains, we started with a perfect planet. Restoring nature will help restore equilibrium. For instance, we could restore peatland. Restoring peatland slows the flow of water, reducing flood risk. It also filters water, meaning water companies can use fewer chemicals. It leads to an increase in biodiversity and it stores carbon, which helps to mitigate climate change. You could come up with an even longer list of benefits if you were talking about planting trees. The climate emergency is even more difficult to manage than the coronavirus. Some organisations like the Environment Agency, which I chair, along with our partners, are working with behavioural psychologists to help us overcome some of the natural human barriers that get in the way. It will expose vulnerabilities and requires courage. But consider this. In Bangladesh, deaths from tropical cyclones declined more than 100-fold in 40 years, from 500,000 deaths in 1970 to just over 4,000 in 2007. This was made possible by developments in early warning systems, 
cyclone shelters, evacuation plans, coastal embankments, reforestation schemes and increased awareness and communication. We currently have all the tools we need to stop climate change, but we also need money. So when it comes to financing and investing in a race to zero and the race to resilience, we must also fire the starting gun for the race to trillions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Against the motion, Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. Please take it away. Thank you. I don't think that we have enough tools to fight climate change. Otherwise, we cannot be in this panel and discussing about it. We must be all in the ground and helping building the solutions. If we are here, we are still lacking a lot of tools. And I think we cannot just to say those tools who exist are also built with the people who are in the ground. Those who are facing the climate change every day, those who are facing the lack of the rain, those who are facing the food insecurity, the climate extreme weather event, like the regions that I'm coming from. This year we have extreme floods around all our capitals, making people homeless and creating food insecurities. And of course, in small islands where we have hurricanes that hitting the communities. So we do not have tools to respond to those solutions yet. And those tools are not built with the communities. And I'm referring to the indigenous peoples who are living in the various ecosystem that protecting forever, who are not including in the decision making and who are not consulted to which kind of tools that we need and which one can be accessible. I'm hearing about renewable energy. I'm hearing about uh, the technology, which kind of technology that we are talking, where the communities do not have access to the electricity, where they do not have access to the clean water to drink, and yet they are the ones who are the best solutions that building for the climate change. They are not including in these global tools. I say we do not have enough tools for the climate solutions because those tools are not there to set communities for the migration because of the climate disasters. They are not there to, to help communities arguing to get a, a strategy for adaptation and resilience. Otherwise, they can build it for them. And we do not have enough tools because otherwise we cannot just to sit and write in the reports. When you take the NDCs around all of them, you have only 14 that mention it, indigenous peoples around the world, why we are saving the 80% of the world biodiversity. You have only one NAPS that mentioning indigenous knowledge. So how we can say we have the tools to face the climate change now? I think we do not have it. We need more inclusiveness, a, a building of the new tools with a different knowledge system. This is lacking a lot. We need people to sit in the tables and take the decision about how we can design our better features to get to the rest to zero, to get peoples out from all the carbonization, and then to go to the 1.5 degree. We do not have those tools. If we have those tools, we cannot stand and fighting for our peoples that are dying because of the climate impact around all the indigenous regions, from the Arctic to the forest, from the oceans, to all the savannas. We, we cannot have our desert burning. We have our tropical forest getting in the fire. If we have tools, we must uh, stop all what is happening and build a sustainable life for those who are in the city, yes, but those who are living every day in the rural areas and depending from the rainfall. I think we need strong tools to come and build a new narrative. But for Time now, is have up. So in that round, we heard not just the what, but the who. Who are we excluding? Who is at the center of this conversation? Round three, the final round. Uh, just a reminder, our motion is, we currently have all the tools we need to stop climate change. Arguing for the motion, Dr. Leah Stopes, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science uh, at the University of California at Santa Barbara and author of a very interesting book called Short Circuiting policy, arguing against the motion. Dr. Rian Mari Thomas, she is um, uh, 
the chief executive of the Green Finance Institute, which is backed by the UK government as well as the City of London Corporation. So, Dr. Stokes, please take it away. Your three and a half minutes begins now. Well, I have had the great joy and sorrow of working on climate change for 15 years, and I have to say I have never been more hopeful. We often say that the key barrier to action on climate change is politics, that politics get in the way. And we finally have the stars aligning to make progress on those political issues. Across the world, people have woken up to the climate crisis that is already on our doorstep. And you've seen young people striking in every continent across this planet. They are demanding that governments act and are being joined by older people as well, saying that we can no longer put off this crisis. In response, we have seen governments, whether that's the EU enacting a Green New Deal, to the Biden-Harris administration campaigning on climate change and pledging that they will continue to make progress, as well as the current Congress in the United States showing that they intend to take on the climate crisis at the scale that's necessary. So what are these political and policy tools that we can use to make the progress that we need? Well, the framework that I like to talk about is standards, investments, and justice. So standards basically say that here's what we have to do in the various sectors where we emit and when we have to do it by, such as a clean electricity standard, which says we have to clean up our electricity system by 2035. And by some miracle, that is exactly the plan that the United States has taken on. And if we clean up our electricity system, and we start powering our buildings and our transportation with clean power and even parts of our heavy industry, we can be cutting emissions by 70 to 80%. We know that governments around the world have money that they can spend on the climate crisis. And we can also share these resources with countries in the global south to make sure that everybody has the technology that they need to be making progress. And that really is the third pillar, which is justice. We can't just be solving this challenge in the global north, we have to be solving this challenge globally by sharing technologies around the world. The fact is that when we pass these policies and continue to make progress, they are going to create a reinforcing cycle where they will create companies, unions, and communities that are benefiting from the transition. And that will drive progress even faster and further by reinforcing the action that our governments are taking. And for those hard to decarbonize sectors that we know will be challenging, we have financing and institutions that can bring new innovations through organizations like ARPA-E in the United States, which can draw on brilliant talent, both across the United States and globally, to find the technologies that we need. The fact is that all we need is government support and ingenuity to really solve our emission challenges. And we have always had ingenuity. It's just a question of where we are putting that talent. And more and more that talent is not going into dirty fossil fuels, it's going into the clean power future. As with all things in life, we only have this moment. We have the now to act in. And we find ourselves in this now in the early days of 2021, looking forward on the decade to come. We know we have to cut emissions by about half by 2030 to hit that 1.5 degrees, and we have all the tools we need in order to do that. Thank you very much. Dr. Rian Mari Thomas, against the motion. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, despite the very articulate arguments made by Dr. Stokes, I'm here to say that stopping climate change requires trillions of dollars of investment, six to eight trillion dollars per year over the next few decades, according to the best estimates, two thirds of which needs to go to emerging and developing countries. None of the efforts or the arguments made on this call so far uh, will succeed in stopping climate change without funding. And we certainly don't lack the capital to deploy towards this the greatest investment opportunity of our generation, professionally managed assets worldwide exceed $110 trillion, and the outstanding value of the global bond market alone stands at $105 trillion. So whilst we don't lack the capital, what we do lack are capital markets that price assets, manage risk, and evaluate performance such that finance is redirected at the pace and the scale needed to stop climate change. Yes, we do have financing mechanisms such as green and sustainability linked bonds and loans, 
that raised more than $700 billion last year. We do have investment funds now totaling almost $40 trillion that aim to align with environmental, social and governance ambitions. And we do have numerous examples of efficiently using government balance sheets and philanthropic funds to catalyze private finance towards climate positive investment. But there remains a mismatch between the supply of money, which is often looking for liquid investment, mostly in dollars, and the urgent need for investment, most notably in long-term infrastructure financing in emerging and developing countries where current estimates of 60 to $80 billion of green investment is currently really concerningly insufficient. Similarly, whilst private finance has responded to the attractive returns offered by renewable energies, as mentioned by Chris earlier, by deploying hundreds of billions of dollars in equity and debt investments, other sectors, including heavy industry, heavy duty transport and agriculture, have yet to attract low carbon investment at scale as many of the innovations needed in these key emitting sectors are not yet sufficiently profitable or cash flow generative to meet the investment criteria of investors or the requirements of lenders. Well-designed public policy frameworks coupled with public-private financing structure can certainly help overcome these types of challenges and facilitate private investment. Public bodies also influence green finance flows by creating the, invest the incentives in which market forces operate. Much, much more needs to be done to shift these incentives towards sustainable investments. A meaningful price on carbon, whilst not a green bullet, is absolutely critical to adjust the pricing signals to which financial markets can respond. Do I believe that the financial sector can and will rise to the challenge of climate change? That we can green finance and finance green? Yes, absolutely. But as of today, a global financial sector structured and incentivized so that it fully factors in people and planet alongside making a profit is a stark omission from the toolkit. Thank you very much. One thing that really strikes me um, is that so much needs to change from the way we move around to the way we heat our homes, to the way we eat, to the way our money is structured. So much has to change. I wanna give our judges a chance to respond to this, um, you know, to these arguments that they've heard the first judge I want to bring to uh, the virtual stage, Nigel Topping. He is what's known as the high-level climate champion for COP26. COP26, of course, being the international negotiations uh, to hammer out a deal um, on, on how to move ahead on climate change coming up in Glasgow, Scotland. Nigel Topping, take it away. Great. Thank you, Samina. Let, well, let me start with uh, the, those four, the motion um i thought you know chris did a great job of making the compelling case that we have the technology in fact i know chris in your innovation scenario and in the latest advice to the uk government you show that with a tailwind on technology we could get to net zero by 2042 so that's compelling emma talked about the three races the race to zero the race to resilience and the race to trillions which are all underway now and are all supporting each other um and 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 leah completed the recipe by talking about the, the need for justice and that ended by saying all we need is government support and ingenuity. I think overall, I'm really convinced by your arguments about technology and ingenuity, but I think you're really lacking um, addressing the huge challenge of all we need is government support internationally. Where's the evidence that we have the political will and the mechanisms to address vaccinations, economic depression, food shortages, and a complete failure to deploy the right amount of capital in emerging markets that we, that, that we need to solve the problem. So that would be my challenge to you to really address the harsh political realities of deploying capital at scale globally. Um, if I take the, um, uh, the, the, the anti team, that the, those against the motion, I thought um, um, so, so to, um, uh made, I think, a really a crucial call to remind us that the range of risk we're talking about now is between 1.5 and 4 degrees. And that if we, if we assume that we're going to land in 1.5, we're not going to plan for some of the risks that are going to be there. Um, Hindu, um, really compelling that we are not listening 
to the voices of those most affected by climate change at the moment and not taking into consideration their knowledge as a harsh reality of a lack of access to electricity, a lack of access to capital. Um, and Rianne Marie, um, again, making the point that there's just nothing like enough capital being deployed. So on the downside, I find you quite compelling, but you failed to mention at all the huge momentum we have now politically with all the major economies committing to net zero in the last few months and that only going faster under a Biden administration. And you were surprisingly silent on the rapid development of technology. Um, so it seems to me that you really need to uh, have a counter argument to the fact that both the politics and the technology are exponentially in favor of us making the transition. Thank you. Tough judge number two, Eva Jones, climate activist, Arctic Base Camp delegate. The floor is yours. You have two and a half minutes to respond to what you've heard. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as a person going into hopefully clients, climate science as a career, um, I will say before the motion presented a lot of data that makes me really excited about my future. Um, I'm a huge science nerd. And so I really do think that the technology is there. And moving forward, we are able to develop green technology to replace all of our dirty fossil fuels. But what I'm hearing from the against team that really, really concerns me is that we don't have the tools to reconstruct climate justice. So we can address going forward how we can change that. But how are we gonna make those climate justice reparations to help those communities who've already been affected, who aren't going to be affected if we don't close the temperature gap, who are already, as Hindu said, facing food shortages, no water and wildfires raging through the areas like my home state of Oregon. The thing is, is for the youth today, it's not a question of if we can have the tools, it's of whether we can get the tools in time. Because I think the biggest tool that as humans we can use is a collaborative work. The fact that we're having this discussion tells me that we have the tools to put our minds to making these reparative justice, to making these innovations happen. It's just a matter of whether we're gonna be able to do that in time. And I think um, hopefully uh, my co-judge Alexandria agrees with me. Um, we have a generation very committed to make that happen and so I look forward optimistically, but um, not without the work to be done. Work to be done. Judge number three, Joseph Mykut, Director of Climate Policy at the Niskanen Center. The floor is yours, two and a half minutes. Thank you for having me and congratulations to our debating teams. Um, and I uh, second the comments of both of the judges that come before me. I think we're breaking down the weaknesses in these arguments as well as the very strong points. So I'll echo a couple things. On the four side, the best case that we've heard is that we have the technology and now the goal setting to meet the challenge of climate change and, and, and arrest global warming in this century. But our argument, but our debaters need to deal with this inconvenient truth that to reach 1.5 C, CO2 as uh, per unit of GDP needs to fall at 10% or even slightly higher than that per year, year over year, uh, for emissions to fall fast enough while we maintain economic growth. And in, two, in 2019, that rate was about 2.4%. So if we have the tools that we need, why does empirical reality show us that we are nowhere near where we need to be? On the against side, the best case we've heard is that we do not have the tools that the, um, we are not in a position to either finance an energy transition nor to distribute the benefits of an energy transition in a way that is equitable or effective. However, in the against side, we need to hear more synthesis and more argument about whether we need new tools or if we need to use the tools that we have to do the hard work of, forcing, of driving the energy transition. For example, the World Bank tells us that carbon prices, one of the best tools that we've heard cited here, are only uh, implemented over 22% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Do we need new tools or do we need to be using the ones we already have to greater effect? Thank you. Thank you. 
Before I turn it over to our final judge, Alexandria Villasenora, I just want, for the sake of our audience, um, to translate a couple of things that you've heard. You've heard a lot of references to 1.5. What does that mean? You've heard references to three and four degrees. Well, that means the goal, what that's referring to is the goal of all of the countries in the world who have signed on to the Paris Agreement, which is every single country in the world, the goal is to limit rising global average temperatures to within 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is the global metric, Celsius. And to limit that warming so that climate change, the effects of climate change, um, so, so that we avert the worst effects of climate change. What pathway are we on now, given how much fossil fuels we are still combusting? We are on a path to warm by something like just a little over three degrees Celsius. Um, all of the, the debaters here are in agreement about one thing. That is not a path that we want to be on because that path is going towards acute crises that face first the people that Hindu Umaru Ibrahim is talking about acute crises like food security, water security, uh, fatal heat waves, extreme storms. So I turn it over now to our final judge, Alexandria Villasenor. The floor is yours. You have two and a half minutes to respond. Yes, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to see some of you I've previously worked with and I'm pleased to meet those of you I haven't met before. So now let me respond to those for the motion. Chris, Leah, and Emma, I agree that so far we have overcomplicated the problem of climate change. Reducing our emissions should be simple, and I can see how we have the technology in place to meet this problem. Those who are against the motion, um, Sveta, Hindu, and Rian, um, Mary, I also agree that we lack the treaties international instruments and political will to meet the climate crisis while centering equity, environmental justice, and those most affected by the climate crisis. We are heading towards, we are heading towards a migration crisis that was barely received any attention at all, and we do lack markets to address the financing we need to pay for climate change. I guess where that leaves me as a judge in this debate is some questions for all of you. Um, does our technology meet the needs of all the people on the planet, or are we only meeting the needs of a few? And I'm concerned that we're not including those most affected in our decision-making processes. In the youth movement, we call this nothing about us without us regarding the political will. We need to start talking about how we move forward if we don't have all the political will we need, because we might not ever get it, or we won't have it in time. So regarding the financing of the crisis, which is the $30 trillion question, I have to ask you all, is capitalism the system that is capable of responding to this crisis? If not, what would we put in its place? Um, Greta often says that we won't solve this crisis with our current systems, and it's time to start talking about the system that will meet this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. While the debaters um, take a minute to uh, come up with their final arguments, we're going to present to you a remarkable series of images taken by my colleague at the New York Times, Josh Hayner. He uses drone photography, still pictures to really show you how um, landscapes are changing and how the people who live uh, in those landscapes are contending with the effects of climate change. So please have a look.
Welcome back everyone to the very last bit of this debate. Our two teams have huddled and they are coming back to present their final closing remarks, representing the four team for the motion, Dr. Leah Stokes. Take it away, you've got one and a half minutes to summarize. Well, this has been such an enlightening conversation for all of us, and I'm honored to be representing Chris and Emma, my teammates here. You know, we've heard a lot that the change will be hard, but that doesn't mean that we can't do it. There's a difference between saying, you know, it's going to be difficult to tackle climate change and saying we don't have the tools to get there. We have the tools we need. When it comes to the political situation, the fact is that things are changing rapidly. With the election of President Biden and Vice President Harris, we have seen leadership in the United States. The Congress has a strong plan right now to enact bold climate legislation. And these shifts in the United States are really being felt globally. I think we're gonna see really fantastic developments, whether that's in April uh, with the summit that they're talking about holding or at the COP um, this fall shifting really the global dialogue on climate change. And that is a response to the political uh, growth around the world of young people and political concern across all ages for climate change. And when it comes to the economic signals, they are also in our direction. The fact is that fossil fuels are in a worse economic position today than they have ever been in. Coal plants are shutting down, oil is at a low globally, and we know that wind and solar and other clean technologies are falling in price every single day. So we have the tools we need, we have the political support and the policy, and the fact is we just need to get started. And the only time to start is today. Thank you very much. Can we please bring up the team against the motion representing um, that team, Dr. Swetha Chakraborty, please take it away. One and a half minutes. Yes, thank you. Those were some fantastic points that the judges made that really made us think and come together on our rebuttal. Regardless of how much support there is for climate change action on the ground and at the multilateral level through the Paris Accords, there is still annual average increases in carbon emissions. This is a stark fact that we need to recognize and call it what it is. It's a true emergency and we need to recognize it, recognize it as an emergency to mobilize all the tools we have and new tools we must invest in. The existing tools still need incredible amounts of support to get us to where we need to be, to protect those most vulnerable from those worst case scenarios. And that's what we have to think for and plan for and include those who are most vulnerable as part of that decision-making process. We need to listen to the voices of those indigenous peoples. We need to create partnerships with public and private sectors to ensure that nobody is left behind. We are in a global social contract and we rely on finance mechanisms to get us there. While incredible strides have been made, we are nowhere at pace and scale to commensurate again with the new tools that we need to invest in to ensure that we meet climate change head on. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, I'm going to give you one um, last shot to weigh in. Any last thoughts on what you've heard? Um, I have some last thoughts. I think that what I am really hearing from everyone here is that we do have all the tools, systems, and processes to meet the challenges of the climate crisis, but we have erased and delegitimized them with racism and xenophobia. So it sounds like the work that we really have to do in this fight is focus on dismantling the systems of oppression that keeps us from hearing each other and working together on the climate crisis. Thank you. Anyone else among the judges? I think we've heard uh, a lot of um, salient points from both sides. And obviously, this is not an easy issue to declare uh, a victor on. I would only say that um, it seems to me that many of the, the tools that we talk about, the policy instruments, the specific actions are existing. Uh, the question is, are we, are we implementing them and are we using them to their best effect? It seems to me that we are, um, I think very compelling case that we have all the tools in terms of technology, in terms of overall political will, in terms of the finance and the economics. Um, I think a compelling case that we're maybe winning the race to zero in terms of mitigation. And then the big questions are whether we have the solidarity to make sure that we win the race to resilience and the race to trillions. Um, 
So that seems to me uh, the 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 what are the tools of solidarity that we need? We haven't heard so much about that, um, and that seems to me where the where the where the question rests. Thank you, Eva. You've got the last word. Absolutely. Um, I am probably going to reiterate a lot of the same things. Um, I think that the thing is is what's really important is that I absolutely we think that what we've heard is that we can make and we can achieve our path to zero, but will we be able to restore, restore communities that have already been damaged by the effects of climate change? Can we do that through our current political systems? Can we do that through our current political leaders? I think that is a question that we are gonna be answering to, and that is a question that many youth are fighting all around the world for is making sure those political avenues, systems, and leaders are willing to go out on, on a limb and not just achieve that path to zero, but restore communities that have already been ravaged by the effects of climate change. That was a remarkable note of empathy and solidarity on which to end this debate. Thank you to all our debaters, to our judges, and to you, the audience, for joining us. Um, you have a chance now to weigh in. Please vote uh, for the winner on the hashtag, using the hashtag uh, NYT Climate Hub. And if you'd like to be kept uh, updated about the events that are coming up, please do uh, sign up for announcements at nytclimatehub.com. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.